uh, be here to be among the students of fabulous, brilliant um, intellectual community. And uh, um, what I'm presenting today, um, you know, in question format, achieving sustainability through industrial, industrial agriculture, um, I don't have an answer to it. And I don't know, you know, like if you may have an answer to it. And I know that, you know, um, China, as a, you know, a state, um, is still struggling in terms of how to feed the uh, the world's largest population, and also to maintain a kind of, you know, ecological um, balance. So what I'm going to do today is basically just to to present some of the things that I just learned literally in the past few months and then to think together uh, with you all. Um, so before I start, I'd like to do a quick survey. Um, when you have a choice, for example, when you do your own grocery shopping, how many of you buy organic food only? Okay, so like about a dozen. Uh huh. How many of you, you know, like a, buy organic food? Like seventy-five percent. Uh, okay. So that. How many of you kind of buy organic food? Like at around fifty percent of the time. Some. How many of you would like to consume organic food? every meal. That's all, right? Um, yes, so, you know, just, it's very clear that we all prefer to eat organic food. We understand it's healthy, it's good for the environment, and yet, you know, still, even in this audience, very few people are purchasing organic food every day, right? 100%. Um, and there's, of course, you know, multiple reasons to that. I'm not getting into the specific reasons because uh, my focus today is, you know, what China can do um, and what's pressing here in this case. Um, what I'm trying to do, I will focus on these three um, kind of issues. First of all, is actually food security. Um, how to feed China, this is a kind of, you know, perennial um, question. And also how to um, maintain this, you know, agri uh, ecological kind of sustainability. Um, and I want to clarify at the kind of uh, concept level, what does food security mean exactly in the Chinese context? And then I'll talk a little bit about the state agribusiness that um, which my research is focused on, and its role in um, mid, um, kind of achieving China's food security, and this new approach uh, by the Chinese state, and also practiced in a way by the uh, state agribusiness. Um, the state calls it the green development of agriculture. So what does it really mean? I hope I can touch upon these issues and uh, uh, yeah, be able to explain. Um, okay, so this was a book published back in 1995. And the title, it was published by the president of the World Watch uh, Institute. The title is quite alarming, Who Will Feed China? Right? Um, we call Paul for a Small Planet. And um, I think it just kind of very clearly um, expresses this global concern about um, ecological sustainability and also feeding the population, the largest one. And in it, well, of course, there's a lot of some flaws, you know, in his data um, and analysis, but still, um, it remains a pressing question in terms of, uh, like he made a comment later, like, 
feeding China is always a global issue. Well, which is true, right? So, um, you know, he predicted that China will only be able to uh, to be self-sufficient in terms of providing food for its own people at a you know like forty-five percent or maybe even a little lower. However, in the past at least two decades, China has maintained a kind of you know ninety-five percent uh, of uh, self-sufficiency with uh, especially staple grains. So um, this is uh, oh sorry. So before I get into this uh, uh, definition, um, just in contrast with uh, Lester Brown's um, estimate, the FAO in, I think it's 2011, um, recognized China's achievements. Um, here I'm quoting, uh, China's tremendous achievements in successfully feeding 21% of the world's population with only 9% of the arable land and 6% of the fresh water. So this is the, um, you know, statistically speaking, uh, indeed, you know, with this limited resources uh, to produce enough food to feed the Chinese population is an achievement. But how did China achieve it, right? So, uh, Um, first of all, food security. The FAO defined it as, you know, for food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So I'm emphasizing this, you know, it's for all people at all times. And availability of food, which means supply of food, right? And this food should be nutritious and safe, not toxic, not polluted, supposedly. Um, so that and, and food apparently here is kind of quite capriciously uh, defined, like whatever you eat. But in China, this concept really means very different things. Um, So I'm listing these three uh, Chinese terms. And in government reports, um, like for example, um, like a month ago, literally, uh, 2019, October uh, the 14th, the Chinese government published a white paper on the status of China's food security. And the word that it used is the first one. It's literally in Chinese means green security. And um, the, I think a better Chinese translation that could be relatively equivalent to the FAO definition would be um, the second one, shu uh, anquan. Um, which is a, a larger category of food. And in China, because of the food security scandals, you know, happened in the past uh, at least uh, two decades, food safety had been a greater concern, which leads to the mistrust of consumers in um, like organic food um, branding, uh, etc. But anyways, what I'm highlighting here, the three uh, yellow, you know, kind of uh, highlighted characters, shi, that in Chinese means food in general, and um, the characters in red, uh, red, sorry, uh, could be translated as security or safety. Um, back to the uh, white paper on China's food security here. Um, 
the large chunk of it is talking about grain supply. Um, but it also kind of includes, you know, meat, vegetables, fruits, you know, all other kinds of food. So, for the sake of this talk today, I will use um, green security for clarity, just to um, to make sure that we know what we're talking about. That China has this policy in terms of keep maintaining, you know, China's green security is to. Um, maintain 95% of self-sufficiency with rice, wheat, and corn, these three staple um, cereals, and absolute self-sufficiency with rice and wheat, which means 100% self-sufficiency. That means, you know, all um, the rice and wheat produced in China would be enough to feed the whole Chinese population. So, um, and this is the, where I want to come in. So, you know, this emphasis on having enough food to feed the population is really kind of, um, was a promise that was made by the <coughs> communist government, you know, back in the 19, uh, in 1949 when the communists took over. Um, and it really was the bedrock of um, the communist, uh, you know, legitimacy. Um, and the government had been, you know, continuously committed to yield increase. And how to achieve that? Um, agricultural modernization had been a consistent goal since the 1950s up until now, even, you know, in the recent publication of uh, agricultural policies, modernization still is the key word. Uh, so I just put it, you know, agro-industrialization, because uh, the meaning of it, of course, it changed over time. Back in the 1950s, it was more about, you know, using modern, um, like, mechanization, right? You know, use more tractors, you know, more efficiency. Uh, efficiency is also a kind of, you know, running theme uh, for, you know, productivity and this, you know, uh, chemical input. Um, there have been, you know, like studies and uh, um, production, you know, starting back in the 1950s, but not in, at a um, kind of, at a large scale. Um, monoculture, which is still talked about, you know, in terms of standardizing um, uh, farmland uh, to connect the small pieces and to increase efficiency, increase the possibility of using large machines. Um, I need to um, like just a little bit about the agricultural kind of uh, reality in China. Um, I think what there are about over 200 million small household farmers in China. Uh, so, in most part of China, especially Central and East uh, China, those, you know, plots were, um, on average, was about two-thirds of a, a hectare. So it's a very small plot, um, which has been viewed as an obstacle to um, agro-industrialization. And so, even in the newest policy, the um, solution to that is still to, you know, connect, um, pool the resources and connect those plots. Anyways, so, so just, you know, very uh, little about this agro-industrialization. Um, starting from the 1980s, uh, with the economic reform and opening up, there's way more investment in agriculture, and especially in terms of economic, uh, chemical input. So, the grain yield increased dramatically since the 1980s, comparing to the first three, uh, right, about 30 years, right, uh, under the uh, communist regime. Um, so, I'm just giving you 
a table that uh, if you take a look oops, at oh here. Uh, so this is the um, nitrogen input on average back in 1981 to 83. That's the beginning of this um, like a, a increased use of chemical uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, herbicides, etc. So back then you only need nine uh, like this much of uh, 126 kilograms of uh, nitrogen in uh, a hectare of uh, rice field, then you can get nine kilogram, you know, um, yield increase. But to achieve similar amount of yield increase, you need almost doubled, you know, the nitrogen input. So as I guess we, I don't need to, you know, get further into the details like to this audience, we all know the impact, environmental impact of this excessive use of um, chemical um, <coughs> materials. So um, backtrack a little bit. People are using more and more chemical uh, stuff in the field and which depleted you know, soil uh, nutrients and you know um, so it, it, it's kind of a, a cycle that you need to put in more to uh, achieve uh, a little bit more and the, 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 the benefit kind of decreases over time. Um, and of course, you know, like the other ecological impacts, of, for example, uh, pollution of water um, and soil, um, soil uh, degradation, um, and in terms of this kind of large industrial farming, um, the deduction in biodiversity, and not only in crop diversity, but also plant diversity, but also, you know, animal breed diversity, etc. And also, um, when we talk about the area that I'm studying, uh, which, um, you know, was built out of uh, wetlands, so the uh, wetland ecosystem, you know, ecological service, um, was significantly uh, weakened. So, uh, okay, now getting to um, the key figure here, um, the Bay Dakong group. It's a cluster of state farms um, in northeast China. If you could see uh, roughly this, uh, you know, kind of a provincial borderline here. This is the Heilongjiang province. Um, that's, you know, Russian Siberia here. Um, and this is the map of the Heilongjiang province. If you look at this, uh, you know, different colored area, you know, this red dots, these are all state farms. So there are 113 state farms. Um, and, you know, over a thousand, you know, food processing factories. And this Beidahuang group kind of really sprawls over um, a territory of about, you know, like a 55,000 uh, kilograms. Um, to put it in context, do you know how big a Bavaria is in terms of the size? Oh. <laughs> it's 70, it's 70,000. So, you know, Beidahuang, you know, the, 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 um, the territory under its administration is that big. And the farmland itself, you know, as I've said, um, on this 55,000 kilo, uh, square kilometers, there are farmlands, of course, you know, factories, administrative, you know, like a towns, um, and you know residential areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the population um, there is a like a little bit over uh, one and a half million people. So, um, anyways, you know, back to the farmland. Um, this is you know the a typical scene in the Bidahuang field. It's huge. Um, it has you know really. really um, 
probably the most advanced uh, technology in China. Now, in many of these, you know, over 100 state farms, uh, they boasted that, uh, you know, like almost 99% of the production from sowing to, or plowing to sowing to finally, you know, uh, harvesting, 99% um, was conducted, you know, by machines. Um, so the annual productivity um, of, you know, like under this umbrella of the Beida um, uh, so this might be a little con um, <coughs> confusing, I'll explain later. Just the one um, Chinese word change, the meaning also changed. Um, so, oh, getting back to, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is the Chinese character called Bei Da Huang. And I was having a hard time actually explaining to Andre about what it really means because I started this research just because I didn't really know what it means. Uh, it seems to be a place, and a lot of people, um, you know, talk about their, especially during the Cultural Revolution, over half a million urban youth have been sent to Beidahuang farms, the farms that I'm talking about, um, you know, to, to farm, to learn from the peasants. Um, and of course, you know, like after 1976, the majority, majority of them returned to the cities. Uh, but still, you know, like there's Beidahuang literature, Beidahuang arts. It's a, a very, very popular term in um, the Chinese culture, uh, every Chinese knows Beidahuang. And yet, to pinpoint where exactly is Beidahuang is very challenging. Um, it's not a place that you can find on any map. It's a cultural reference to a place in the far north, uh, in the bleak area, historically speaking, not um, densely populated, not um, civilized, you know, in contrast to the civilized, you know, uh, core in um, central, sorry, central east China. And this place had been a um, de um, destination for political exiles, for banishment, you know, as a punishment that, you know, people in history back hundreds of years ago, actually up until the 1950s and early 60s, um, you know, political uh, dissidents, like the rightists, had been also, you know, moved to this area. So this is a photo I took from a wetland reserve, um, and it probably, you know, in most of the places, um, 70 years ago, 60 years ago, may look like this. Um, that's also why it's called sorry, the Great Northern Wilderness. Um, sorry. This is the um, the photo a photo I took back in 2015 in the summer, the first time ever for me uh, to go to a state farm and actually any farm. I grew up in the city, uh, didn't really knew anything about this. So, um, monoculture, of course, uh, highly standard dyes, you don't see any kind of wheat in it, it's kind of really well taken care of, et cetera, et cetera. Um, best, uh, almost the best, uh, um, yeah, I think it's the model in China for agriculture uh, modernization. Um, just a little bit, this is the, you know, the history part, I'm a historian, this is, you know, my lead. So, you know, most Chinese, you know, learned about this uh, term, Beida Huang, from this generation, the urban use, you know, being sent to the countryside. Uh, this is an illustration of how, you know, back in the, um, the late 60s, how, you know, people arrived there in the West, the cold, typical image of the wilderness back then. Um, but, 
you know, even though this group of people were the most familiar kind of <coughs> image of Bei Da Huang people, um, there were, you know, there were only a small chunk of this um, people who had been cultivating land in this area. And actually, the majority of them, as I've said, you know, uh, returned to cities. So, um, what we have actually were, at the beginning, group of, I mean, uh, like, war veterans being systematically deployed onto the Bedouin land to build army farms. So, even today, many of the farms are still carrying, you know, those kind of uh, military uh, characters. Like, there are still farms just called Farm 291, Farm 581, etc. So it's kind of their, um, uh, what do you call that, like military, military cold or units, etc. So um, the person sitting in the middle um, was a general uh, back in the 1940s when China was in war with Japan and also the communist base area was kind of um, uh, suffering from an embargo from the nationalists who were in power. Sorry, um, And he was the one who led his soldiers um, kind of transformed a roughly kind of barren land and turned it into farmland. And it became a legendary kind of, you know, figure in terms of uh, uh, leading troops to, for land reclamation. And he did, you know, become the first minister of the Ministry of Land Reclamation. So it's a, a very unique ministry that existed for about 20 years. Um, that also tells us about the, you know, to achieve this goal of feeding the whole population back in the 1950s, opening new land to increase yield. That was the priority. And so millions of people, literally, uh, and also including uh, rural use back in the 50s and 60s from other densely populated area like um, <coughs> Shandong, Sichuan, Hebei, Henan, those places, you know, moved to this region. So, um, as I've said, this area, um, especially, you know, this, this is, uh, so, okay. Uh, the Beidawan farms were basically located on two plains. And this plain, in particular, was kind of an alluvial plain um, made by these three rivers. Um, this uh, Amma River, Heilongjiang in Chinese, um, Sangali River, um, and uh, Usuri River. Um, it's back in 1949, that's you know, when there's a heavy land reclamation intensive farming, uh, or before that began. Almost half of this area was covered by wetlands, right? You know, within 50 years, uh, there's only about 8% of wetlands. So, as you could imagine, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, species, you know, back in the 1950s, when these migrants come over, um, like, there were quite a few kind of folklore uh, stories, or uh, how do I put it? Um, popular sayings, like for one to describe the fertile soil um, that hasn't been touched, you know, by who hasn't been farmed heavily, the black soil. Um, one saying is that the soil is so rich, you can stick a chopstick in it and it will bloom. That's <laughs> right. Um, the other saying that describes the um, Biodiversity there uh, is, um, what is that? Okay. catching deer with a stick, wooden stick, um, catching fish. Um, sorry, I should have. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Catching fish with a ladle. Um, and, uh, you know, wild birds just fly into your pot directly. It just, you know, like, it's... The sense of abandoned, you know, resources there, you know, in the wilderness, you know, waiting for humans to come over uh, to, to make use of it, you know, claim ownership over it, was abandoned in the literature back in the 1950s and 60s to mobilize people to come over here for farming. Um, and of course, you know, the environmental issue now is really uh, pressing. Um, this is what you see now in that region. That's the high rises for a residential area where, you know, there's farm uh, <coughs> workers, um, administrators, you know, where people live. And again, this emphasis on um, technology, science, um, and uh, is standard farming, etc. Um, so, Beida Huang has become, since um, the late 1990s, the largest commercial grain producer in China. And by the time of uh, you know, 2006 and 2007, it could feed pretty much, you know, like 10% of the Chinese population. Um, on top of this, you know, like a grandiose, you know, productivity, um, it is also China's largest green food producer. Um, the latest uh, data uh, says that it, uh, about 70% of its farmland had been you know, green food, um, for green food production. Um, and this Beidahuang group, as a agribusiness, um, is on the market and it's, it has become the largest uh, agricultural brand in China. And the state is really working to uh, support this agribusiness to grow in order to compete with the international, you know, agribusinesses like uh, what is that? ABC, those big fours. I always can't really remember the exact names. Um, the ABCD. Uh, <laughs> um, so, anyways. Um, there's a lot of concerns about this um, food market in China that because now like almost 70% of cooking oil are under control of these you know like the international global uh, agribusiness. So China has lost a, you know like a, um, a control of price over. Um, market price over um, cooking oil. So um, given the particular, you know, um, diet like in Chinese culture, uh, rice and wheat you know, are particularly crucial. Um, actually in Chinese, fun literally means rice or uh, wheat, you know, um, cooked material. So um, that's why this is you know, for 100% self-sufficiency. Um, I'm just you know jumping to this green development uh, policies started back in I think the first time that uh, this term was coined uh, and published by the state council was back in 2016. Um, and again, because of the pressure to feed China, um, yield increase remains the priority for agricultural development. And, but again, you know, as we all are aware of, the ecological you know, impact of this previous you know, um, heavy um, farming or, uh, chemical input, etc. So to recover this you know, um, ecological environment is also a priority. Yeah, um, so there's has been like 
the Chinese government has come up with this new term uh, starting from 2007. Um, this new term was, about, uh, was uh, building ecological civilization. And uh, it was, you know, almost equally important as agricultural development. Um, and later, the government also proposed, uh, started to talk about ecological security. And this is why in the title of my talk, I use that word, just um, eco-security. So food security, meaning production, yield increase. Uh, eco-security, meaning to be more ecologically friendly, um, for longer, um, I guess, still productivity. Um, so, what to do? Um, one of the basic issues is to reduce the use of chemicals and to improve uh, the efficient of chemical use. Um, and of course, you know, like a, there are different uh, uh, ways. Like the president has been talking about. Um, like green mountains and clear water are actually gold mountains. So in a sense to capitalize on this um, ecologically uh, vulnerable um, you know, environment to uh, stop farming in those areas but to transform this area like, pretty much for tourist development. Um, and there's you know, emphasis on using green energy, uh, you know, circular, circular economy meaning, you know, um, reduce waste, uh, recycle, you know, uh, resources, materials, etc. So, the role of Beida Huang in this is still, as a producer, um, it was the largest one. Uh, the main crops were, are, sorry, rice, wheat, um, corn and soybeans. Um, it is also the largest green food producer. And here I want to talk about this green, this idea that um, you know in China the standard for green food is different from what you know we may think outside here in the EU or in North America. Um, There are actually two grades within this green food uh, category. Um, the lower grade is that chemical fertilizers were controlled. That means still used, um, but not you know using too kind of toxic uh, chemical stuff. Certain chemical, you know, uh, materials have been banned, and also, um, uh, right for a higher grade, which is the grade AA, um, is uh, pretty much I'm not very sure, but uh, uh, let's say zero chemical input. However, as I learned this summer from um, uh, people on the land that this certification for grade AA green food production, like the soil need not to be test tested. So uh, as we all know that you know this chemical residues could be in the soil for uh, a long time. So anyways, um, as a whole this large organization had been able to um, sort of um, keep its promise of, you know, having zero chemical increase uh, in its production. And, um, yeah, as I've said in the beginning, you know, with the survey, we all understand the benefits that agriculture, eco, agroecology, sorry. <laughs> Uh, could bring, right, you know, to produce organically. Um, but that doesn't seem to be uh, possible in the near future in the Chinese system to be upscaled. There are a lot of small 
farms, you know, especially in suburbs in around big cities, that there have been like, community-supported agriculture. Um, people, you know, produce organically, and the food, you know, was, uh, was uh, um, transported in a short kind of food chain. Um, so the consumers um, have better trust in the quality of the food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I'm trying to you know, uh, introduced here is that this agroecological concept of from field to table, which means to shorten the, um, to, to um, tighten the connection between um, consumers and nature and their food, etc., etc., has been appropriated by this state ever business. And they are using the concept to create this green, intelligent kitchen. Uh, so green, of course, is the you know green production that they have been certified. You know, using less chemical stuff. You try to use you know or gradually using more you know organic uh, um, fertilizers, etc. Um, this intelligent kitchen. It means digitization um, to increase consumer trust and also to increase um, uh, what do you call that? You know the the um, value of the food that they produce, right? Um, they are actually expanding their control over you know this food chain. So from you know, seeding to the final, you know, food processing and packaging, the whole process was supposed to be, you know, controlled by the Beta Hong group. And so their food, you know, from the very first step would be coded. So, you know, at each step that, you know, once the consumer get this food, you know, to scan the barcode with their cell phones. They will know, like you know, where this food is exactly from, from what part of the field, you know, from which farm, and then you know, where did the food, you know, the, the say uh, rice go, you know, throughout this whole process system. So that's their interpretation of this digitized um, world. That's how. This beta on food is supposed to get to your kitchen table. So I'm reminded of my time is up. So I'm, I welcome questions, comments. Yes, so